Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are very excited uh, to uh, present you Squirrel today, a library, a Python library that we just open sourced for efficient data loading for large scale deep learning. Um, and today, I will tell you how to use that library to load data fast from local and blob storage for every deep learning framework and share it through a data mesh. How awesome is that? But <clears throat> first of all, I want to tell you a little bit um, about uh, Mirantic's momentum, because this is important to understand why we actually built Squirrel, this solution. So I'm myself leading the engineers at uh, Mirantic's um, momentum, um, and we cope with like lots of different uh, AI use cases on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, so we take the journey with our um, clients from various industries, from finding um, AI use cases with them, researching them, um, then also building them um, into an AI solution and bringing them into production and operating them. So end-to-end -end the full chain. And our focus uh, is a lot on deep learning um, 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 models, and uh, we try to um, leverage uh, the latest uh, research actually in production systems, which is very challenging. And we do this across various industries and with very diverse data. So you can see NLP data here, computer vision data, structured data, um, you name it. And also different ML tasks. So from detection, classification, um, learning some embeddings, um, and in information retrieval, like the whole thing um, uh, we do for our clients. And we built a very flexible um, stack to uh, cope with all these data and ML um, challenges in our um, projects. And since we are building very state-of-the-art uh, deep learning uh, models, usually these models are large, they need a lot of data, so you have to uh, feed um, these beasts of computation graphs um, with huge amounts of data um, very efficiently. So in a nutshell, you get some raw data, either from clients or um, from some public data sets. You prepare it so it's nice, juicy, and tasty for your model, and then you feed it to your model and uh, let it train so it learns the task. And Squirrel is about the later step. So taking the training data and feeding it uh, to your model training um, at maximum efficiency. So if you're doing this naively and you might start training a new machine um, learning model um, on the deep learning framework of your choice in the cloud, you um, might experience some um, long training process. And maybe your cloud bill goes up pretty quickly. Um, and you pop up your NVIDIA SME and have a look what your GPU is doing, what the training is doing, and you uh, see a behavior like this. Um, so your GPU utilization jumps around quite a bit. So you can't make um, use of the um, GPU hardware um, all the time. Um, so this should be the ultimate goal, to keep that um, GPU busy, because you're paying a lot of money um, to, to basically rent these machines in the cloud or even use them on-prem. So what might happen is you have these three very abstract steps of first loading, so loading it from a disk or loading, downloading your data from a cloud, a specific sample, then preparing it um, for the model training, and then copying it over to the GPU memory. And if you are not um, investigating some um, yeah, parallelization, you would do this sequentially. But in an optimal scenario, you want to pack this together uh, in an asynchronous way so the GPU is always busy. So let's imagine you have like a um, use case uh, from medical imaging. 
So this is a um, histopathology images, um, a very standard HE stained image. Um, it's fairly large, so these uh, images are like 200K by 200K pixels. So not your average, um, I don't know, NIST image that you, you have in your research project, um, uh, but a fairly large image. And what you usually do is you take a sliding window and to each of these window slides, you apply a neural network, which then predicts the class that you want, for example, background or tumor or non-tumor. Um, and if you want to train such a model, you have to feed it one of these windows, and then it has to predict the task. So if you are doing this naively, you would slice up the image, and you would get billions and billions of small um, files or uh, these windows. If you store them locally, good luck opening this folder um, in, in your file browser. Or if you're storing it in the cloud and you're trying to download it, for example, from a, a cloud bucket, then you already pay lots of money just for downloading all these small files because you pay per file downloaded. Um, if you store them in shards or just leave them in one large image um, or in a format like ZAR, you um, have the uh, issue that you might want to shuffle your data, um, but if you just s take like windows but slide by slide by by moving the uh, the window over the image, um, you have like very correlated images, and since the image is so huge, uh, you will not uh, get a lot of um, randomness in here. Um, Moreover, if you get new data, what do you do? Um, um, basically interleaving the new and old data set. Do you want to copy it? Uh, lots of questions that you are, uh, that you are facing, which leads to, um, to engineering um, efforts that you have to add to your project. Um, and these challenges, they reoccur. And now your model is trained, and it might not work that well. So here you see this red marker, and usually models don't work that well um, in these regions because yeah, some, um, someone uh, painted on the actual image and um, removed some of the important features. So you might want to debug the model and reti uh, retrieve the specific patches um, that lead to model failure. But if you're using some uh, data formats or slice everything up, mm, then you have to find this particular crop again. Uh, and for that, you need metadata. Now the question is, how do you store the metadata? How do you link all this together? You can do this like in a data frame, store it to a disk, uh, or like a CSV file to a, a database. But all of this is custom and gets hacky pretty quickly, and you have to build that yourself. So lots of questions um, arise. And there are different uh, frameworks um, out there which are all great for their purpose um, that try to ease parts of this uh, process. So you have, for example, TensorFlow data or PyTorch data to load um, your data into your um, model, basically, when using these frameworks. Um, but the speed and also the, the capabilities are very limited. And then there are frameworks that try to solve these challenges by either providing some additional abstractions um, or um, providing their own data format, like Active Loop or, or Hub from Active Loop web data sets or um, Hugging Face or FFCV. Um, but then you have this um, um, challenge you might want to share your data between um, your members of your project or between teams. Um, and there are solutions by hugging phase or intake for that. Um, and if you want to pre-compute features, there's like Feast or Hopsworks, um, or if you want to um, have like l um, faster data transforms, like faster data augmentation, then you might want to use NVIDIA DALI. But all of these frameworks, they do one particular thing, and they do it very good. But if you have to cope with all these different ML um, use cases, then using these frameworks together is pretty cumbersome, and they lack certain features that we um, would like to have uh, in our projects. 
Um, so our journey of actually um, finding the right framework uh, was pretty intense. So we started with using um, raw files. This was obviously very slow, especially if you have um, the use case that I showed before. And the reusability of um, the data loading code was super low to, to non-existent. Then we switched to TF records, but shortly later we also switched to PyTorch. And uh, PyTorch and um, TF records, they work together, but it's not a very um, pleasuring experience. And since you don't have an index, um, this uh, debugging of the um, ML models uh, also get very cumbersome. Then we move to ZAR. So ZAR is an excellent um, framework for storing tensors in, in chunks. Um, but this leads to many, many files in the cloud, many connect, uh, connections and cloud costs. And we try to, um, to optimize the, the ZAR library to make this more efficient, but um, the engineering efforts, they just escalated. So this was not a fit for us as well. And then we tried out some um, more narrow libraries. Uh, we looked at web data sets, but it uses native file formats by default, and uh, this brings its own challenge, uh, challenges, and you have the painful ML debugging again. And then we tried Hub, good for images, but didn't work so well with text. Then we tried Hugging Face, which uh, uses pi error under the hood, not so good for images, but for text. And then FFCV, again, good for images, not so good for text. And we have large data sets, so we can't store them just on the disk. And this is just not provided by FFCV. So there was no solution for us. Uh, until uh, now, so we collected the key requirements um, that um, we need from our past experience. And uh, we came up that we want something which is uh, very efficient and doesn't produce a lot of cost just by downloading the data. We want to keep the GPU always um, utilized and load only the stuff from um, the remote um, place that is actually needed for training and nothing more. Uh, it should be easy to use, um, and we don't want this issue anymore of um, having unnecessarily connection. Moreover, we have these very different uh, use cases and different data modalities, so the solution should be flexible. And we learned it the hard way. There's not one format that solves everything. So we need something which is flexible, can cope with different formats, and also easily can handle new formats if they arise. And multimodality should be a first citizen. So if you have like a um, sample here, which is um, here illustrated by dictionary, you want to have an image next to text, to metadata, but also your, your labels here, and don't need like very specific data structures to, to store these different kinds of um, data. Um, moreover, the solution should not replace frameworks that are already great. It should integrate with these frameworks and make them even better. And um, it should be also very um, good for rapid prototyping and not be a beast that you have to um, get trained on for 10 years. Um, and since we have lots of small teams that collaborate uh, a lot, we uh, also thought about um, data sharing between these teams. So if somebody prepared a, um, a data set, curated it, this person might want to share it with another team. And if you do this with a central hub, then you have a single point of failure. You have to invest in an ops team that runs this platform, and if it doesn't work, your company might stop. So we wanted to go for a centralized system and identified that there should not be a central point of failure. It should be very lightweight to operate the system. And um, since we want to have it um, decentralized, people should also um, operate their part of the infrastructure themselves in a self-serve fashion. Um, and um, also the agreement on the basically standards between the different teams should be also uh, governed 
uh, in a distributed way. So we didn't found a solution uh, for us, um, not a single one and also not a combination of different uh, frameworks that solve this for us. So uh, we build it on our own and here's Squirrel. It's now open source and it's a library to share, load and transform data in a collaborative, flexible and efficient way. So to understand what this Squirrel is, um, Squirrel contains primarily three abstractions. So the foundation of everything are the iter streams. Iter streams in a nutshell are just chainable iterators with a neat API to do so. Then the next layer are drivers. Drivers let you read and write different data formats um, from local and remote places uh, and implement um, different interfaces on them. For example, an iterstream interface. So you can uh, load data from one specific data format and then get a standardized iterstream interface back. And now the sherry on top is the catalog. So the catalog is a dictionary-like data structure that maintains all the different data sources that you're subscribed to in the data mesh um, and lets you um, access all the different um, um, ins uh, instances of drivers and from there also the iter streams. So how does that now look in code? So let's start with the iter streams. So here we have this list, one, two, three, and we put it into an iter rebel source uh, object. And now you have this very convenient uh, dot-like API where you can chain with two um, um, basically an, um, um, yeah, a, a callback onto it which logs these values, in our case, to an ML flow server. Now the next step would be um, adding plus one, like in a map um, function with this um, lambda that is here defined. The next step would be an async map. So the same, you square the, the value, but now this is done in parallel, in different uh, uh, threads, basically. And the last step is filtering um, uh, your pipeline by everything which is dividable by two. And now you can use um, the result and um, basically ingest from that. In our case here, a very simple example in a for loop, but imagine now you can pipe it to your um, yeah, deep learning framework. Um, and these chainable um, um, iterators are very flexible. So now you have seen, um, first I might lock my um, throughput um, to an experiment tracking server, but then I do some transformations of my data. And here in the example that you see on the left, um, the parallelization is done in threads, but you can also um, leverage processes or DALI if you want to go to the GPU, or if you have like super crazy uh, data augmentations, imagine you have like 3D um, elastic deformations that you want to do uh, online while training, you can offload this to a DAS cluster. And then you can chain other uh, functionality on top of it, which uh, have some short ends like filtering, batching, and all the standard stuff that you usually need. But be careful, this is a very powerful API and the parameters, they matter. So here's an example. So you have an iterable source with 5,000 values. You shuffle these in an uh, in-memory buffer and then ingest from it. And if you look at the correlation of the values in, um, yeah, in the stream that you get back, then you can see that, especially in the beginning, the values are very um, correlated. But why is that the case? Yeah, you set the wrong um, um, parameters. Your initial uh, buffer is too low. So um, you get some correlation. So be careful if you deviate from the standard parameters. Uh, it's powerful, but you should know what you're doing. Um, let's now move to the second part of Squirrel, which are the drivers. So drivers let you load and write um, for, from different data formats 
locally and from remote. Um, our preferred data format is message pack. It's very small and very fast to um, deserialize, which is pretty cool. Um, and we use FSBack under the hood to enable um, loading from local and remote places. So here you can see three examples. Um, here in the first example, we take the message pack driver and from a local um, um, folder, we basically create an iter stream. And now we can use it like on the previous slide. But you can do the same with JSON-L. Um, and since we are having FSBAC, you can do this also from a remote uh, place. Um, but there it doesn't end. We also have integrations with other frameworks. For example, with Hugging Face, we can directly ingest from a Hugging Face um, data set, but on steroids. But what happens now if you have a data format that is not support, uh, supported by Scroll yet? We are using the amazing uh, Pluggy framework um, to uh, let you uh, extend Scroll. So let me show you an example. Um, Imagine you have like a um, graph database. This is now very mocked up. Uh, and you implement a class which inherits from the ITER driver interface. You give it a name so it can be later also um, addressed. And um, you implement this get ITER uh, method, which um, instantiates an uh, iterable source and in our case um, takes like random walks from our graph and uh, returns this in an iterator. Um, and now you're already done. Um, to make this um, usable in um, Squirrel, you can either register it um, directly via the plugin manager, or if you want to distribute your driver, you can register it like in a classic plugin fashion via your setup by entry points. So now people ask us all the time, yeah, this is all nice looking, uh, but how fast is it actually? So we did like a um, small benchmark to show you, is this actually fast enough? Uh, so let's start with images. So FFCV, for example, is a library that tries to be very fast at loading uh, images from um, um, a local place. Um, but there are also other libraries that try to solve similar things. Um, and here we are loading a very standard uh, data set, CIFA 100, um, onto the GPU. And you can see that the samples that you have on your GPU per second um, with Squirrel uh, are more or less um, the same as with FFCV. But now what happens if you want to go remote, load from a remote um, GCP or S3 bucket or a database, whatever? This is not possible with FFCV, um, but with some other frameworks, but Squirrel is much faster here. Um, but what is now about text? Because we want to um, be able to load different kinds of um, modalities. So let's now load Wikitext 103. Again, locally, Squirrel really shines here. Um, and if you go remote, the same. So you get really high speed um, for different modalities. And it doesn't really matter if you load locally or remote. In both cases, it's very fast. But what if this is not fast enough for you? You might have like very expensive um, data transformations. So you can uh, leverage different frameworks to make um, the transformations faster. So you can use Torch Vision uh, pipelines or NumPy. You can JIT compile your transformation, similar what also uh, FFCV does. Or if you want to go full in, you can offload your uh, computation to DALI and uh, let it transform on the GPU, which is even more faster. So here you see an example with a very simple pipeline and the performance uh, on different frameworks. Let me now come to the cherry on the top, the catalog, or the data sharing functionality. So here we figured out the concept that we actually want is 
a data mesh. So a team has a prepared data set and it wants to offer this data set as a product to other teams. Um, and you can think of it, they get kind of a capsule and the interfaces in these capsules are standardized. It's more like a contract, um, how to load data and how to serve data to others. Um, but in this capsule, you can do whatever you want. This is basically the product that you're building, your like, team IP, more or less. For example, transforming the, your data and then serving it to others. However, this is more like a concept um, and more like an organizational uh, philosophy which was populated by uh, ThoughtWorks and McKinsey and others, but there's no real opinionated open source implementation um, out there for machine learning that helps you um, actually realizing this mesh, um, but more like um, standard solutions that people try to um, plug together to, to bring up this vision. But there's an implementation now which is Squirrel, and let me uh, guide you through it, what it actually does. So you can um, take this catalog object uh, and um, retrieve a dictionary-like structure from it from all the data sources that you um, already subscribe to. And here you can, for example, access ImageNet if somebody else uh, hosts it and um, get the ITER stream directly from this ImageNet data set and start training. And we thought that there should be three different ways how to share data. The first one is within a project. So you have a code base, um, so why not use the Python API? So you instantiate a new catalog object which is empty, you describe your source, for example, which driver do I want to use, what are basically the arguments from where to load it, and some metadata, and assign it to some ID with some version, so these sources are versionized. And now we implemented a set API on top of the catalog, so you can um, do different joins of catalogs, for example, here in this example, the um, default catalog that you subscribe to and your custom catalog in your project and you get a unified catalog to access all these data sets. If you want to share data between projects, um, we suggest to do this via a Python package. So we are already in the Python ecosystem, so why not use the deployment mechanism of Python itself? So for that, you have to implement a pluggy hook, um, like here in this example, which lists you all the sources that you want to distribute. And now you um, add the specific hook to your setup pie, like you always do with pluggy, and distribute the whole thing as a Python package. And if somebody installs your Python package, for example, via pip install, then they already get all the data sources that you provided um, via your package. If you have like a continuous delivery pipeline for machine learning, you might not want to generate Python code uh, and um, pass it between steps. That's why you can also serialize your catalog as a YAML file and then um, scan um, specific locations um, for these YAML files and um, yeah, create this catalog object again from it. And this is especially um, interesting if you have like a whole um, machine learning pipeline end to end and you created um, um, a data set in one step and want to pass it to the next step, for example, and have um, this whole process um, yeah, documented more or less and versioned. So now you've seen these three API levels and let me show you an end-to-end -end example so you see what is the full thing. So let's train the beast um, on ImageNet. So the first step is to get your catalog from your um, standard subscriptions, access ImageNet, and get the driver object. So this is loaded in a um, lazy loading fashion. 
So now you want to get an um, iter stream from it. And this driver defined several um, splits. So we want to get the training split. And since we are training in a distributed way, you might have different um, nodes for training. But on each node, there might also be different workers that do the training in parallel. So instead of downloading the whole data set on all nodes and all workers, we provide hooks to split the data set already before downloading it to the specific machine. After comes the shuffling of the samples. So imagine uh, you have now a stream of samples. Um, and uh, this stream gets now shuffled in a window of uh, 100 samples. Next is applying some uh, runtime transforms. So here we transform the image um, and uh, return a, a tuple, basically. Uh, finally, we want to pre-fetch this whole stream uh, in an asynchronous way and then batch it together in batches of 64. And now you can continue with what you do uh, all the time. So here's some pseudocode. Uh, it might look different for the deep learning framework of your choice, but you have some trainer, and you can pass your just iterator uh, to it and train your model. And this is basically it. This is an end-to-end -end example how to use um, Squirrel in your training code. So why should you use um, Squirrel now? So first of all, we um, think the API is just fun to use, which is a great asset for us. Um, moreover, you have a lot of functionality to prevent GPU stalling. You have like prefetching, you have this asynchronous transforms, you have these key hooks uh, and more, everything to keep your machine busy and get everything out of it. Moreover, you don't have to trash what you already built, but you can continue using your preferred frameworks, but now on steroids. Finally, we provide one of the first implementations of the data mesh concept for deep learning and are very excited for your feedback. So now it's your turn. If um, I sparked your interest, um, you can uh, find um, Squirrel on PyPy and also on Conda. We provide um, a data mesh uh, node with some um, Squirrel data sets um, already. Uh, also, give us some love on, on GitHub. Uh, and if you need any support, then join our Slack channel and meet our amazing uh, Squirrel developer team. Um, and I guess now you have some questions. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you have lots of questions. <laughs> um, why, is it, why is it much faster than other frameworks? What is the trick under the hood? There are many tricks. I would say <laughs> um, one, one um, interesting thing is message pack is quite fast. And we do a lot of things um, in an asynchronous uh, fashion, um, which makes it even faster. Thank you. Loading data requires a combination of CPU and I.O. bounded tasks, the former blocks of the GIL. How does a Squirrel mitigate this? Um, the user can decide. So you can uh, separate um, the CPU and I.O. Uh, bound tasks so that um, you can uh, utilize both in the um, best way. Uh, and you are very freely um, to to decide whatever fits your specific use case. And if that is not enough, then just offload it uh, on a dask cluster and um, just put a lot of compute uh, on it, and then it should work. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice talk. Nice talk. Thank you. Uh, when showing the benchmarks, I was wondering how you made sure that for the other frameworks, you use the most efficient implementation. Um, we didn't. We used the default <laughs> parameters of the frameworks, so uh, we didn't uh, hy uh, did hyperparameter optimizing for all these different frameworks. But since these are very preliminary um, um, uh, benchmarks, I wouldn't um, put too much interpretation into it. Uh, we are right now preparing a more elaborate uh, benchmark 
so you can see all the different um, yeah, knobs that you can turn to, to make it even faster. Just out of curiosity, how did you come up with the name Squirrel? Um, very good question. So uh, all of our um, software solutions at Morantix Momentum have um, animal names. So we have Squirrel, but we also have, for example, Chameleon, which is our computer vision solution, or we have uh, Parrot, which is our NLP solution, and so on. So we have like different, um, yeah, animal names, and uh, Squirrel in particular, there are several reasons, but uh, one punchline is it's a data infrastructure library which doesn't drive you nuts. <laughs> um. uh, do you use a job queuing system, or what is your approach to fully utilize all GPUs without idle time? Um. I think I, uh, I digged a little bit into it, like you can use um, this splitting of CPU and I.O. bound uh, tasks, you can use a DAS cluster, multi-processing, multi-threading, uh, depending on the individual uh, step, um, and um, yeah, that's basically it. If you, if you want more, go DALI, like you can combine all these frameworks uh, within Squirrel to get the most performance out of your setup. And since we have very different ML use cases and data that we are coping, we also have um, different setups for different tasks. But since the API is very easy to use, people love um, putting together their, their pipelines for their specific uh, ML problems. Thank you. Uh, does the Squirrel support splitting streams, for example, for N cross-field validation? Um, not by itself. But if you want, you can use um, um, this two method and um, plug in whatever uh, callback that you want. Would you agree that most aspects of Squirrel are not limited to deep learning, but might make sense also for other data processing flows? Um, also a good question. So we have heard this already a few times. So we built this for uh, actually deep learning uh, training, but of course you have this um, process or this problem or challenge of getting data onto your machine in a very fast way in also different scenarios. Uh, and it's also possible to use Squirrel there because it's data or yeah, it's a framework agnostic. Um, but this was not the intentional basically design, but would be happy to see how you use it in, in other creative use cases. Um, yeah, that would be cool to learn. Thank you. Uh, does it also work with multiple GPUs? Uh, yes, of course. That's why uh, we have um, these, um, these hooks, for example. If you um, uh, want to distribute your training, then you can use the hooks to um, feed the samples that are, for example, for one specific GPU just to this GPU. And you don't have to like download it for each GPU and then discard most of the data um, in memory. Thank you. Uh, next question. Could you describe what was the issue with Pi Arrow? What was the slow specifically? Did you reach the dev team? So. Pi Arrow itself uh, is more like a, a columnar uh, format. Um, and if you are not just reading one of these columns, but uh, want to, in a very fast way, read um, like rows of it, um, it doesn't provide you um, with lots of functionality here. And if you have tensors like images, also the deserialization was not that fast, as far as I remember. I think the next one is kind of a duplicate, but uh, what exactly explains the higher throughput observed with Squirrel? Yeah, I think that's a duplicate. Yeah, already <laughs> answered that, okay. Uh, have you been able to measure effective increased GPU usage through parallelization with Ether streams? Um, to be honest, like right now, these Ether streams are so fast that we can load much more data than we can actually process on the GPU. So it's just the maximum. <laughs> so. 
do you plan on evaluating um, bigger data sets? Uh, yes. So this was just a very pre preliminary um, evaluation just to show you something, but um, a larger evaluation is in the pipeline. Uh, someone wants to know if you're going to share the slides? Um, no, but I think the talk will be uh, online, right? Okay. Uh, the last question is, uh, can you define a own way how to split the data set easily? I'm not sure I understand it, actually. Um, I think it's, again, a duplicate. You can, uh, <laughs> you can provide these key hooks to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, please, let's thank... Um, Yes. <laughs>